The Time Machine Did It, Chapter 14 I woke up the next morning cold and cramped. The room, as advertised, was a miracle of understatement. No heat, no lights, no blankets, no bed, just me. I washed my face in some snow that had drifted in through the window and dried it on a handy rodent. Then refreshed, disheveled, smelly, and hopeful, I headed out to make my mark in pre-war America. I found a likely-looking street corner, one with lots of foot traffic and no competing detectives, and began accosting passers-by, asking them if I had any crimes that needed solving today. Detective, I yelled. Crime solved, mister? Trace something for you, ma'am? Who wants a detective? Business was bad at first. Everyone was evidently satisfied with their current detective. But I finally attracted the attention of a man who, as luck would have it, was actually on his way downtown to hire a detective. This chance meeting would save him some shoe leather, he informed me, rubbing his hands. He asked me if I came highly recommended, and I said I sure as hell did. That was all he needed to know, and he started explaining his problem to me. Unfortunately, the lunch hour was just starting, and the foot traffic on my street corner suddenly increased. Pedestrians kept pushing their way between us, and a street vendor rolled up and set up shop next to us, yelling out for the good news that he had peanuts for sale. My prospective client asked me, Do you have someplace else we could talk, someplace quieter, like an office? I told him yes, I did have an office, but we couldn't use it right now. He asked me why not, and we stared at each other until both of us started to go to sleep. Finally, he realized I was never going to answer him. Well, we'll do it here then, he said. The thing I want you to investigate is connected with the Danielson case. What's that? You know, the ferry boat scandal over in Marinara City? Oh, Marina City? Where's that? Uh, never mind. So I lost my first client. I realized I was going to have to bone up on the current events and geography around here if I was ever going to be of any value to my clients. I made a mental note to see if there was a library in this town. While I was making and admiring this mental note, a cop nudged me with his nightstick. Move along, he said. You can't be a detective here. I didn't want any more trouble with the police, so I moved to an area where no pedestrians were walking, which satisfied the cop, but made it harder for me to conduct my business. I could yell and wave at passers-by to come over where I was in the flower bed, but no one seemed to want to do that. If anything, they moved further away from me, the louder I shouted, and the more I waved and made faces at them. I reassessed my situation. It was clear that if I was going to be a successful detective here, I needed an office. That would cost money. And I'd need furnishings, a desk, file cabinets, a client chair, and so on. That meant that at least for a while I was going to have to get some other kind of job, a less glamorous job, until I could build up some capital. This was a little depressing for me, because I like the power and prestige that goes with being a, sh a Seamus more than the power and prestige that goes with saying pushing a mop. But I cheered up when I remembered that I was the man from the future, I was 62 years ahead of these pre-1950 yokels mentally. I'd wow them back into the primitive past. The first thing I did was check out the want ads in the paper, but I was in for a disappointment there. Every job seemed to require some experience or skills I lacked. Do you know how to be the comptroller for a canning company? Or how to build infernal machines for anarchists? I don't. And the lowest level jobs were out too because they insisted that I not have some of the qualifications I did have. Like, they didn't want me to have more than a third-grade education, because they felt that if I had a fourth-grade edu education, or its equivalent, I wouldn't be carrying sewer pipes for them very long. It would just be pit stop for me professionally. So it seemed I was overqualified for some jobs, and underqualified for the rest. The general impression I got was that 1941 could get along perfectly well without me. But if there's one thing you can say about us Burleys... Okay, Torgesons, see chapter one. It's that we don't give up right away. We don't give up for months. So I went out on a series of job interviews and tried to bluff my way through them, saying, yes, I was fully qualified, whatever you said, or no, I've never heard of the union movement. What's that? Whatever, I guess they wanted to hear. Lying like this works pretty well, I've always found, because it all allows you to tell a prospective employer things you could never tell him if you were being truthful. But you could tell that to the youth of today, and they won't listen. 
They think they know it all. The only times I ran into trouble uh, were when I didn't lie. Like when I inadvertently filled out employment application forms with accurate information. My birth date, for example, raised a lot of red flags. Born in 1965, eh? Some personnel guy would say. Uh, yes. I guess that makes you about minus 24 years old. I'm more mature than my age would indicate. Sometimes I get over all the other hurdles, and they take me out to the work site and see me in action before they hired me, to see me demonstrate the expertise I had bragged about on my application form. This was a problem because it's easier to bluff your way through a written test than it is to bluff your way through real life. They would ask me, for example, to run along a steel girder 20 stories above the pavement carrying a bucket of rivets. And I would, using this same example, fall off. So there goes that job. But just when I was thinking I'd never be able to make any money in this time period, I found exactly what I was looking for. I was walking down the street, fingering the three cents I had in my pocket, and discovering I now only had two cents because I had fingered one of them to pieces, when I passed by a window with a sign in it that said, Day Jobs, No Experience Necessary. Other signs in the window were even more encouraging. No experience? No problem. Prison record? Hooray! Can't read? Read this! I went inside, and in almost no time, I was earning real 1941-style money. My first job involved being set on fire in a vacant lot so the fire department would practice putting people out. I made five dollars doing that. And the sign in the window was right. No experience was necessary. All I had to do was stand there and scream. Anybody could do that. 